Hello. Uh, if we've never met, I'm Ronnie. I'm, uh, I'm part of this team, the API Academy. Uh, there's a few of us at this event. Uh, you probably know Mehdi, I hope. Uh, Eric, Mike, and myself. What we do is we help people build better software, build better distributed, connected software. Uh, and we do that in a lot of ways. And one of the things we get to do is uh, we have a chance to take some of the, the guidance, uh, the conversations we have, you know, coming to all these conferences, helping people build this stuff, and turn it into material you can consume. So the, the thing that's come out this month that we've just produced is this book on API management, uh, just in time for Christmas, right? I know uh, kids really love this book. My son uh, reads this every night. So if you're looking for a gift, this is the one. Uh, the things I'm going to talk about will, will touch on some themes from this book. Okay, but in this title is Digital Transformation. I put that in the title so that people would come to the talk. Uh, the truth is I always find this, uh, this term a little bit troubling, digital transformation. Uh, I've been hearing it for years. Uh, a lot of the people who I help, the people who I work with, uh, are engaging with us in the academy more and more because of these digital transformation efforts. Uh, but for the longest time, I've been struggling to figure out exactly what it means to go beyond the hype. So uh, we're going to talk very briefly about what this is from my perspective. But more, we're going to talk about the people platform, the, the organizational design and changes that you need to power this stuff. Um, so originally, you know, if someone asked me what is digital transformation, I really wasn't completely sure, because as far as I could tell, it was companies saying, well, we should build more mobile apps. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, we should have APIs. Yeah, you should probably have APIs. Uh, that sounds like just doing business to me. Um, but what became obvious as I started speaking to uh, people who were in leadership positions is there's, there's something more happening here, right? There's kind of a shift. If we think of strategy this way, it's a pretty normal way to talk about strategy, right? We have goals. From those goals, we can derive some tactics, right? A tactical plan to achieve the goal. And from the tactics, we can derive specific actions, specific activities. Uh, what became obvious is, you know, when I was working in a large bank in Canada, I was constantly being told, this is a bank, not a tech company, right? So for the longest time, we were really delivering IT solutions at the action level. So we're enabling strategies, but it's the activities of technology, creating a platform that makes this stuff cheaper. Um, if you've lived through this, then you know, in terms of things like services-oriented architecture, the goal always seems to be about reuse, right? Driving down costs so that we can enable business functions by forcing people to use, for example, the same web service to do many things, right? That was kind of the, the idea. Uh, where things have started to change is we're seeing these digital pieces of work or the technology pieces of work move higher up in the stack. So now people might think about tactically what we want is to build the best mobile app. Uh, or maybe even more shockingly, pretend that they are a tech company or become a tech company, right? So the goal actually becomes a technology one. So that's bigger than just saying we're building an app, right? That represents a shift in maybe in culture, right? We use that word a lot in this space, culture. It kind of reminds me a lot of these other ideas, and they all seem to be connected. We hear them always with digital transformation, right? Design thinking, user experience. What all of this, to me, is really about is uh, having that empathy and considering those other perspectives for the business. So if I take something like design thinking or user experience or customer experience or service design to its logical conclusion today, I end up doing things like digital transformation because the things that my customers want are those things or the things that are easier to maintain are those things. So for me, they're all kind of related. Um, to make that happen is difficult, right? That's why people are interested in this space. Because it turns out to be that kind of company is a challenge. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things to figure out. And one of the ways to get through this kind of sea of uncertainty, when you're not sure, is to do things like iteration. So we hear a lot about that, right? Uh, maybe you're familiar with uh, Deming and his PDSA wheel, right? This idea of doing experiments, using data, 
measuring results, right? This is the way that businesses can move forward in that kind of digital transformation space. So we're going to try things and keep trying things over and over. The big challenge we hear a lot about is speed. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to do small iterations, then they must be fast so you can move far. So just about every digital transformation talk talks about speed. But in just about every meeting room or architecture planning session or meeting with uh, sea levels, what actually comes out is the safety idea, stability. Because if you were allowed to move fast and break things, this would be a lot easier, right? But most of you who are doing transformation are operating in contexts where you can't afford to just break things or have the video stream stop or the audio stream stop because you're not dealing with those kinds of things. You're dealing with things like uh, banking, finance, insurance, transport, logistics, telco networks, right? So the, the context, the risk profile is different. So the challenge becomes somehow finding this kind of balance or harmony. We want both speed and stability of change. So to make that happen, we hear about technology platforms. And it's the reason why it makes sense at a conference like this to be talking about digital transformation. Because these kinds of API-centric technology platforms can foster that, right? This is part of the puzzle we have to put together. If I can make smaller things, uh, I have a better chance of making changes quicker, right? Because the change is constrained. I don't have to change the whole thing, I change a small thing. If one small piece fails, maybe the whole system keeps working. Or maybe your company is one box in this, and you think from an ecosystem perspective, right? We can be part of a bigger network of things that are happening. So that idea of componentization, that idea of integration or interoperation becomes important. But the truth is, all of this stuff is not very changeable, right, on its own. Because it depends on people to build it and change it. We're at a point where people talk about things like machine learning and adaptability, but the code that we write is not very changeable. Uh, it's scalable, it can replicate itself, maybe it can heal itself, it can retry connections, but what it can't do is add new features, right? Or implement the kind of business changes we're talking about if you're going down this digital transformation road. And it's the reason why when people tell you about microservices architecture or API design, they need to talk to you about the people who are behind it. Because it turns out it's the people where all the change happens. And nine times out of 10, that's where we need the most optimization. So we end up with these two systems. A system of people who work together to produce a system of technology which drives your digital transformation. Okay, so we need to dig into that and understand it. We also live in an era of great practitioner advice. Um, everyone has a solution to these problems, and there's some really good ones. Uh, here's some popular ones, right? We, we've all heard of uh, Spotify's tribes and squads and chapters. Uh, a lot of big companies, in fact, have incorporated it. I even see it on job postings now. You'll be joining this tribe. You'll be joining this squad. Uh, we've all heard of Netflix's culture. Right, the one that Patty McCord kind of put together, and they shared this. this here's, a, here's the Netflix culture in a presentation. This is how we built the company we did. And these are great stories, and they're very appealing. And we live in this amazing time where people are sharing their practice so we can learn from it. But don't confuse these outputs you know, with how they got there. These are frozen moments in time, something they produced and they shared with you. Right? that was suitable for their context. The big mistake we can make when we go on these digital transformation journeys is to just take something like the squads and tribes and apply it, or decide that our whole company will be agile without really understanding what the forces are, what the principles are that we're changing. Right? So we need our own strategy, something that fits our own context. So what I propose is we look at that network of people who are building things, in the same way that I might look at a system architecture 
and we program it, right? We think about what the, what the forces are that are underpinning it. And I find it's really all about decisions, right? The work we do is a sequence of decisions. And there's three principles that matter a lot for decisions. The first is how we group decision makers. The second is how we optimize coordination. And the third is how we distribute those decisions. Okay, so first, talking about grouping, we hear a lot about this. How big should a team be? Equally, who should be on teams, right? How much skills should each team member have? Essentially, what I'm describing is a, a boundary setting. So if we have our employees, a group of people, somehow we draw a circle around some of them and say, you're doing that. For the most part, we do this naturally. Uh, you can show me the biggest team, and usually somehow it's subdivided, right? We kind of naturally go down that road. Because having uh, big teams becomes challenging. Right? Now, one of the things in our book we did was uh, we, a we actually turned to Mehdi and said, hey, Mehdi, uh, if you could design the perfect team, what roles would you have on it? Uh, and he kind of put together this list. These are all the people who would be on a, on a great API team. These are all the roles you would need. Okay, so that covers a lot of spaces. And you've heard a lot about these different kinds of roles today. You'll hear more about them tomorrow, I'm sure. If we had one person to do each of those roles, I would say that's a big team. It's not a small team. Right? So you're faced with this kind of challenge. You have to have this understanding that there are skills, there are roles that you'd like to fill. But if you build it out as a big team, you'll end up with increased coordination costs. Right? People have to talk to each other. Things will go slower. If you make the team smaller, you'll have less specialization. So one person has to fulfill more skills. Right? So there's kind of a talent implication. It's harder to scale these up. Uh, if I have 15 small teams, does that mean I have to have 15 experts for each team? Because talent matters. Right? So this idea of uh, how big a team should be becomes important and challenging. What becomes more important, it turns out, is the feature of being able to change these boundaries. Because right? the truth is, it's all going to depend on context. What you need to build into your system is the ability to move people around, to change team sizes, and to move people where they're needed most. And that doesn't happen by accident. That happens because you put those things in place. The second thing you'll need to do is optimize all that coordination. So I said if you're a big team, there's going to be more coordination. What does that coordination look like? Uh, one of my favorite um, references for this kind of work is uh, Henry Mintzberg's models on how people work together. He defines five ways that people coordinate. The first one is the one we all know, because it's kind of our natural way. A small group of people can coordinate through mutual adjustment. In other words, we can talk, right? This is the value of small teams. You can move fast because I can tell you what I'm doing, you tell me what you're doing. Uh, we just communicate and we move fast. The challenge here is size, right? I can only do mutual adjustment up until the point it becomes unviable. And that's where you hear about things like Dunbar numbers or pizzas, right? These are all manifestations of this idea that there's a limit to how well you can coordinate in this way. The other thing we're used to is direct supervision. In this case, we have coordination being done by a single person who's in charge. So they have the coordinating brain, and they instruct us on what to do. The nice thing here is we can have extreme specialization, but now we have to scale in a different way. We end up with these hierarchies. Okay. Now, surprisingly, these are not the only two ways to do coordination. You can also coordinate through standardization of work process. If I gave you a book, and I said, for our tech team, here are 16 patterns you need to implement. You learn what those 16 patterns are and when to use them. I can now create coordination not through small teams or through supervision, but through some kind of standard process. Uh, equally, I can run an assembly line and teach you how to do this, and then you can work on the assembly line, right? It's that same kind of idea. We can automate some of it. And then you have a coordination mechanism that can scale. The challenge there, of course, is you know, how flexible is it? How easy is it to change? And it may not be. We can also standardize on work output. I can say, here's our business objective. You form a team, 
And however you want to do it, you achieve this objective. I'm going to give you autonomy over implementation, design, and everything. But what I'm going to measure is whether you're able to meet that business output we're looking for. Right? So we can coordinate in that way, too. Uh, we can also coordinate based on people. I can say to work in this company, you have to be of a certain level of talent. Right? And because you're at this certain level of talent, I can distribute some of the authority and I can say, I know you're going to do the right kind of job. And it's this idea of talent that turns out to be one of the big context variables. So we've got these five coordination mechanisms. The truth is you end up using all of these in different kind of ways. The world isn't as simple as we're sold in conference presentations, right? That what you do is you make small components, follow Conway's law, build some small teams to go along with them. That challenge of figuring out who's on the team, how the teams coordinate, and how system coordination happens turns out to be the really hard part because you're trying to get this speed and safety. So I could say mutual adjustment, small teams, that's the answer. But at scale, it becomes a challenge. Uh, and that's the work someone in your organization is going to have to do to figure out how you solve this problem in your context. And one of the ways to do that is to distribute these decisions the right way. Who makes, the, who makes which decisions? Who has authority? Who has the right knowledge? This is classically framed as centralization versus decentralization. Right? And what we're told is decentralization is going to help you. You'll do better if you start distributing decision making into these small teams. And that's the way a lot of uh, tech companies operate, right? or so we're told. The truth is it's somewhere in between. You are going to centralize some decisions, no matter how small and agile you are. Sometimes you need the system level view. Sometimes you need the person who can see the forest. Those are decisions that need to be centralized. Sometimes you have constraints on talent. Maybe I don't have 10 you know, five-star designers that I can put into every team. In that case, I may have to pay the performance price, the speed price, so that I get better quality. Some decisions are too risky to decentralize. Right? Maybe there's some decisions we can't undo. If we go through that door, as Bezos puts it, we can't come back. So you might centralize those as well. We decentralize the decisions where we want local optimization, where someone who's on the ground can make better decisions. Maybe choosing a programming language is one of those. Right? They can pick the technology that makes sense for the problem they're solving. It works best when we have talented people, though. If you work in a context where people can't make good individual decisions, then decentralizing is going to be very difficult. In reality, decisions are not so big. We can break them into small pieces. Uh, and in the book, I, I show you how you can break decisions into steps. And once you break decisions into these steps, that is, the person who comes up with the options doesn't have to be the same as the person who says, yes, that decision is OK you can distribute things differently. I can centralize the part where I say, these are the programming languages you're allowed to choose from, and I can decentralize the part where you choose the right language for what you're trying to do. Right? So we can start to map things out in that way. And that can help give you a more nuanced view of how to make all this work. It's a very technical way of looking at decisions, right? Like a very kind of, here's some coordination mechanisms, here's some distribution elements. Kind of lost in that, I guess, is this idea of culture. For the most part, if people talk about digital transformation and people, like I said, they're, they're going to bring up culture, this kind of amorphous blob called culture. There's um, precise definitions for this stuff, like Edgar Schein has this model. Uh, there's the more commonly used one. This is culture, right? How we do things around here. It turns out culture, yes, is incredibly important. Right? If you're going to transform, transforming your culture becomes a, a core part of that. And one of the big reasons is culture is how individual decisions are shaped. If you think of devops -y type of work as being automation, automating some of the individual work to make it safer and faster, culture is the automation of decisions. Right? So instead of making sure everyone is doing things the way I would like it to, the culture automates that because that's just how we do things here. Those are the kinds of decisions we always make. 
but it's difficult. Uh, one of my favorite stories is from uh, Alistair Coburn, who uh, had a big part in the uh, Agile Manifesto. And he was on this podcast about Agile transformations. And he, he says, you know, sometimes people ask me to tell them about a successful Agile transformation. And he says, I don't have any of those. I don't know of any successful Agile transformations. He said, because what happens is transformation happens while the person is there and they're making it happen. And the people who kind of don't go along with it, who, whose hearts and minds don't get captured, they get quiet. And when the pressure goes away, those people rise back up and things kind of float back to where it was before. Because changing culture means changing people, right? And that's not a, that's not a one year uh, limited budget kind of piece of work. Now he does say though that you can become an agile company. It just means the success stories aren't about changing people who have been there for 10 years. It's about planting a seed somewhere, starting something else, or getting the people who are interested in changing to, to do work. The takeaway we can have from this is that you're not going to change your culture in, in a quarter or a year. Right? That's a, a longer journey. It could take a few generations. You'll see some impact, or at least you're not going to create a lasting change to your culture immediately. But the good news is there are other things you can do. So all of those practitioner stories, the, the Spotify stories about tribes and guilds, all of the, the Netflix culture that happened, happened because they experimented. Because they had a goal, and they kept optimizing their organization towards that goal. You can do that too. Even better, if you understand these kind of under, underlying principles and forces, you can get to that goal in your own way a lot faster. And you can do that today, right? So understand those principles, dig into it a little bit better, and uh, facilitate your digital transformation by designing your people platform. Thank you.